Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. It is my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things dealing with COVID-19 and this international crisis. Today, we're honored to present a conversation with two leaders from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. We'll be joined by Dr. Saumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, and Dr. Sylvie Bryan, Director of the Pandemic and Epidemic Diseases Department. We can't think of two better people to help us understand where we are with the virus today and how we look ahead to learn the lessons of yesterday. Dr. Saumya is on Twitter as Dr. Saumya, so please follow her at Dr. Saumya, and please follow Dr. Sylvie at SC Bryan on Twitter. We'll start in just a moment. Please tag your friends. Please hit share. People are gathering from around the world right now. Please put this on your Twitter, on your Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or on all those platforms and tag a friend. You know someone somewhere who would benefit from hearing this information. And you can ask a question or just tell us where you're watching from. This is our 99th episode. We've been live for 99 straight days since the start of the lockdown in New York City. Hello, everyone. I'm Sri, and I'm just honored to have you all with us here today. Thank you for being here. Tomorrow is our 100th episode celebration, and we're also marking it by talking to folks about Juneteenth, the celebration of the end of slavery, a holiday that was not celebrated outside the Black community but now more and more people are paying attention because of these times. So we'll be doing that tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern time for a special two hour edition. Now we want to bring on stage our two very special guests. Please get ready to ask them questions. Please share your thoughts as we bring on stage Dr. Saumya Swaminathan. Hello. Hello, Sri. Thank you for being here. And Dr. Sylvie Bryan. Hello. 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 Uh, we just want to start by asking the same question we ask everybody. How are you doing? How's your family and how are things in Geneva? Dr. Salmia first. I'm doing, doing okay. I'm doing, uh, I think we've all been incredibly stressed and uh, working nonstop since January. My family is all back in India. I'm here by myself, which may be a blessing in disguise because I can throw myself into my work. And I think it's uh, just an incredible time to be at WHO heading the science division. And in terms of, your, you're right now in the headquarters, right? Is, is that correct? Yeah? Okay. And how many people do we have working on this from WHO, roughly? Like how many people are working on uh, uh, aspects of the, the pandemic? I think it will be easier to count who's not working on the pandemic. <laughs> because everybody's been mobilized. So it doesn't matter whether you're in the emergency department or in the immunization department or in the TB department. Everyone is in one way or the other working to, uh, to uh, contribute uh, to the health systems, you know, uh, and to service delivery in, in countries. Because apart from dealing with COVID, you know, life is going on. People are getting sick. All the other diseases haven't gone anywhere. Babies are being born. Children have to be immunized. Others have to receive antenatal care. Tuberculosis hasn't gone anywhere, neither has malaria. So it, it's even more uh, uh, important now that we don't forget about all of those things which have traditionally killed millions of people every year, particularly in the lower income countries. And, but thank you. And we will come to that topic specifically in just a bit. Let's say hello to uh, Dr. Sylvie, Sylvie Bryan. Uh, tell us how you are and your family. Hello. Uh, I'm fine. I mean, as Sumia said, uh, very busy, and so uh, we start to get a bit tired after six months or more. Uh, but um, but we need to keep up because um, it's not finished. And uh, my family is okay. They are with me in Geneva. Um, my husband and my son got COVID, so uh, I can I have had the opportunity to know the disease from. Uh, many perspectives and angles, but uh, also from the very personal one. So, but now they are fine, and so I'm okay. Oh, I'm so grateful to hear that. That must have been extra 
problems in the middle of everything else you're doing with, but they're okay. I'm glad to hear that. Let's get right to the issues. Uh, tell us about your office of pandemic and ep epidemic, the epidemic diseases. What does it do exactly and how does it fit into the structure? And then we'll ask Dr. Salmia about how her work as chief scientist fits into everything. Yes, the department uh, focuses on, on uh, epidemic and pandemic diseases. It includes, I mean, we, we look at dangerous pathogens. So whether it's uh, Ebola, Zika, uh, plague, uh, the coronaviruses like MERS or, um, or the influenza. So the things that uh, are usually, fortunately, quite rare, but uh, when, when they become pandemic or epidemics and then pandemic, uh, then it's, it's a big uh, issue. So, um, and unfortunately, they are more and more frequent because um, people are moving a lot. Uh, around the world and so uh, when people travel uh, viruses travel as well so we are busy and, and what does that mean in terms of your funding and all of that we are seeing so much news about how the united states has pulled out and they're recommending that they cut the funding talk about that how is that affecting your work this is one of the things that we all want to understand why it matters that the u.s participates well, our work is, is mostly uh, technical work. We, we, uh, we manage a network of experts around the world because, um, uh, you know, science nowadays, it's not only in one uh, place, it's, it's everywhere. Everywhere contribute to um, um, building up uh, the knowledge on those viruses. So it's very important to uh, make sure that people are connected. So the funding helps us first to... Um, hire uh, experts in, in WHO so that those people can then in turn manage networks of expertise around the world involving all countries to contribute to this effort to uh, build this knowledge. Thank you. Let's ask uh, Dr. Salmi about her work, Chief Scientist. Uh, tell us about that title and what is your organization like within the bigger organization? So it's interesting that, you know, the science division was only set up last year. So we, we are a year old, and I'm the first chief scientist. Uh, I'm incredibly humbled and honored to be in that role. But everyone comments that this was the right time for WHO to establish the science division because we've been in the heart of, uh, of fighting this uh, pandemic from the first day onwards in tracking what's happening because a new virus, right? So the solutions have to come from science. You have to understand everything about this virus. Uh, and then you have to find uh, the drugs and the vaccines and, and everything that's going to then ultimately control the pandemic. So search and innovation has been part of our uh, response from the very beginning. And I've been leading a group from that across the organization that's really come together. And we've been able to set up these global networks of experts, which, by the way, is the way WHO works anyway. We work through our networks of experts, but we specifically set these up for uh, an innovation in COVID. And in fact, we are reconvening in a couple of weeks to, to see what have we learned in six months, what are the remaining challenges, and how can the global scientific community further come together. And we've seen incredible, incredible collaboration and a willingness to share. People get on a phone call every week in, in all of these different working groups to share what they've learned. Um, it's really, really incredible to see that the desire to work together so that's been one major activity and the other one has been on all of the guidance that goes out and you know WHO is a normative agency so we put out guidelines and guidance and standards um, and these documents need to be uh, very carefully reviewed and quality assured because the whole world depends on WHO's guidance or at least a large part of the world does and therefore uh, there's a whole team that's working again round the clock uh, including with Sylvie and, and her group to make sure that all the guidance that we're putting out is is completely scientifically validated, evidence-based, of a high quality and answering the questions that people are asking. So I would say that I think science division was created just at the right time and we're able to provide a service now, not just to the organization, but I think uh, to stakeholders all over the world. If you can talk a little bit about the science of this virus, why are we in this situation today? As we know, we have seen various uh, coronaviruses before. What is the science behind the troubles we are having right now? 
Well, I think uh, Sylvie can say more. She's had a long experience, but I would just say that when you have a new virus, um, first of all, it was incredible that it was identified so quickly and that we knew that it belonged to the family of beta coronaviruses. We, we could see the entire genetic sequence on the 11th of January, very early into this uh, pandemic. And therefore, diagnostics were actually developed within a couple of days and were able to share the protocols with labs around the world so that labs around the world were able to uh, start diagnosing this infection. And that's why many countries started picking up cases in January. So, so that's a, a, the power of science. That's the power of, of uh, what we call whole genome sequencing, which you can do very quickly now to learn about the pathogen. The other thing is, of course, learning and gradually we've been accumulating uh, the knowledge about how it transmits. It's highly transmissible. We know that. What are the clinical manifestations? We know the groups of people who are more affected, the elderly, people who have underlying conditions, heart disease, obesity, respiratory disease. These are the people who get the severe forms of the illness. We're still learning about the inflammatory response of the body. For those who really get sick and end up on ventilators, the virus itself is going down in the body by then. It's the body's own inflammatory response that is creating havoc in the lungs and in the blood vessels. And, and then, of course, we are uh, working on clinical trials for drugs, uh, as well as a development of new vaccines, which normally takes a minimum of five years, usually 10 years for a new vaccine. In this case, the global community has set itself the impossible target of coming up with a vaccine in 12 to 18 months. And we're in the center of that, trying to coordinate and, and, and really drive that. Thank you. Let's just quickly see who is watching from around the world. Uh, Anand says hello from India. Uh, Jonathan's watching from Union Square in New York. Uh, we have uh, Doug watching from the redwood trees, literally under the trees in this Bay Area. Uh, we have Imtahaz watching. We have uh, Radian watching from uh, New York. And uh, folks are saying welcome. Sudha saying welcome to the honorable guests. And uh, Rose, our, one of our producers, says, honored to be on this call with these women leaders. And she is uh, active in a movement called Women to Follow, hashtag Women to Follow. And these are certainly Women to Follow, at Dr. Salmia and at, Dr., and at SC Bryan. Please follow both of them as we discuss what's happening with this virus. We'll meet some of our other uh, uh, viewers as well. Uh, Dr. Bryan, if we can uh, go to you, if you can talk a little bit about uh, where you see the the vaccine, where are we right now? Uh, there seems to be a lot of movement, but we don't know, or there's a lot of things happening, but is, 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 is uh, where are we exactly? Well, like, what, what is very interesting with this uh, pandemic is that it happens also at a time where uh, there is a lot of activity in terms of new technologies. So we see also that there is new platform for producing vaccine, and this is really exciting because um, um, for many other pandemic disease or epidemic disease, we are still working with very old technologies uh, of vaccine that were initially uh, discovered in the 20th century, and, and they've been they work well, so we have kept them. But um, uh, now we see that we can have a new generation of vaccines. So, um, so some of those vaccines. So now we have 130 uh, candidate vaccine. So um, a lot of uh, biotechs are working around the world to, to try to develop those, those vaccines. Uh, some are on platforms that we know already, others are on new platforms. And so we are anxiously waiting to see uh, how, how those vaccines uh, will work. Uh, there are some, of, some candidates, uh, a little bit more than 10, that are already uh, entering the clinical trial, which means that uh, uh, you don't distribute a vaccine like that. You first try it on a small number of individuals to see if it works, if it's safe, and before trying it to uh, So those tests are done very carefully because uh, we want a very safe vaccine. Uh, but at the same time, as uh, uh, Dr. Sumia said, we try to accelerate the process and, and uh, carrying out um, uh, things in parallel instead of doing it uh, sequentially, just to make sure that we have um, uh, this new vaccine uh, very rapidly. And so it's, it's a very important time because um, uh, clearly um, 
maybe the vaccine will not be the magic bullet, but at least it will be a, a very important additional tool in our um, a set of intervention, and, and it can be a, a game changer in terms of um, uh, protecting uh, vulnerable population, protecting elderly, and, and, and making uh, the world a, a much safer place. And that's what we all hope. Let's go to uh, just ask uh, Dr. Salmia, in terms of your sense of optimism about where we are, do you think that uh, this is something that we will have to live with at a low level, or do you see the this is something that we can actually battle and win over? Yeah, that's a really good question, Sri. And just for our viewers, my Twitter handle is uh, doctor, at Dr. Samia, but it's the full word doctor. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'll fix it. Thank you for catching that. I'm, I'm so sorry. We'll fix it right away. Okay. Thank you. So in terms of um, where are we going with this virus? I mean, I think it's, it's still difficult to predict. It could go in many different ways. But the way that we think it might pan out is that the virus is very well established now in, um, in most countries around the world, in most populations, though some countries have been able to really contain it and bring it down to very low levels or even, you know, temporarily get rid of it. But the moment people start moving, the virus will move with them. We've seen in Beijing now that after 55 days, they have another cluster of, uh, of cases. So it could be that this becomes another endemic human virus. We have so many viruses that we've learned to live with, including the influenza viruses, but also other coronaviruses. We've, uh, except for SARS-CoV-1, that hasn't shown up again after 2003 4 We have a lot of coronaviruses that cause common colds. And then, of course, we have the MERS coronavirus. So it may be that we learn how to keep it under control through both the public health measures and hopefully a vaccine so that uh, you get these occasional cases and you know and you know a lot of people who get it actually recover from it most people recover from it they don't really get sick um so that's one scenario but till we get to the point where enough people in the world have immunity uh, you've heard this term herd immunity talked about herd immunity is when enough proportion of people in the in the population uh, have, have antibodies or immunity to the virus so that it stops spreading from person to person so for this virus we probably need 60 70 percent of the of the population to become immune and then you can actually you know ramp down the, the transmission to very low levels that is easily achieved through a vaccine to get there through natural rounds of infection like what we're seeing now cities which have had a peak you find sometimes 10% or at the most 20% of that city, people become with antibodies, they become immune. But so that will take many cycles. And uh, for the immediate future, I think we need to expect that this virus is not going anywhere, that it will either go like this up and down in waves. It could go down completely now, come up again in the winter months when people tend to cluster indoors, or it could go up and stay up between some countries where the peak has become a plateau and uh, it's not really going down very rapidly. So we, it's interesting to compare what it's doing in different countries because that also speaks to the response. Thank you. Uh, we have Dabir watch, watching in Washington, surely listening to Pandemic Through Leaders. Sounds authentic. Great panel. Congratulations. So it's great to have you all here. There's a question that Ashok is asking. He says about the hydrochloroquine and why was it withdrawn? It was so uh, he th he he believes it was successful. So this is the kind of information time we're living in. Dr. Sylvie, talk a little bit about that, please. About uh, information, misinformation, disinformation, and how do you fight that along with the health problems we have to fight? Yeah, um, at WHO we call it infodemic. Uh, you know, it's an epidemic of of um, information and disinformation as well. Uh, and um, every epidemic, we have this kind of thing. Uh, and, and I think it's, so we try now to manage this infodemic because uh, uh, we have seen that you, you cannot suppress the infodemic. You can just manage it and, and make sure it doesn't uh, uh, affect people. Uh, because some, some misinformation or rumors can be uh, very dangerous. Uh, for instance, um, a few weeks ago, there was this uh, rumors that uh, um, Methanol 
uh, can cure the disease. And, and we have seen that 400 people died in Iran uh, because they believed it. And so those rumors sometimes can be really um, harmful. And, and so we developed tools to protect people uh, and help them to um, differentiate uh, good information that will help them to fight uh, uh, the pandemic and information that is uh, uh, either uh, incorrect or sometimes uh, can be really dangerous. And so um, infodemic management is, is uh, not new, but um, uh, what is new is that now, because of the social media, uh, those rumors they spread very fast and, um, and much faster than the virus, at, at least. So uh, we need to have new tools to contain those, uh, those rumors and make sure that, that they will not hamper the response. And, but it's not typical for COVID-19 because, for instance, we had um, um, rumors. I, I remember when I was working in uh, Angola for uh, a response to a yellow fever outbreak, uh, there was a rumor that if you get vaccinated, uh, against yellow fever, then you cannot drink beer for seven days. And so um, many people didn't want to get vaccinated for this reason. So, uh, and we saw uh, a really um, a decrease in the uptake of vaccine because of these rumors. Or um, in Ebola outbreaks, for instance, sometimes rumors are circulating that Ebola doesn't exist. And then people are not uh, cautious enough and they get infected just because they believe that that this is not true, that Ebola is circulating in the community. And so this is why I think we all have something to do with uh, infodemic management because everyone uh, is spreading information. And, and so we have our responsibility as well to, um, to manage the infodemic. But at, at WHO, we take it very seriously and we have also um, we develop with partners uh, myth partners to try to address uh, as rapidly as possible the uh, information that is not correct. Uh, uh, thank you. Iman is watching. And so she's putting in some of the JAMA links as well. Let's uh, talk to uh, Dr. Salmia. Uh, who is with us. Uh, she's a chief scientist. Her Twitter handle is at Dr. Salmia. And we have about 10 minutes left, maybe a little less. And we have a, 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 a reporter from Scroll, our partner in this show. And she's going to ask a couple of quick questions. Amanat Kuller is here. Uh, let's bring her on. Hi, Amanat. Hello. Hi, Dr. Salmia. Nice to meet you virtually. Uh, I'm going to jump right in. Could you talk a little bit about India's response to COVID-19, where lockdown measures have now been eased, uh, but there's a daily spike of about uh, 10,000 to 12,000 cases? Well, India is a complex and a difficult challenge, challenging uh, situation, obviously, just because of the size, the population, the high density in the city, and also the heterogeneity, everything from remote tribal and rural areas to these highly dense uh, urban settlements uh, in the cities. So I think there needs to be also a, a, a strategic response based on the local uh, situation. So a decentralized, data-driven, community-based response, which is happening in, in, many of the, in many of the places. You know, it's to be expected that as uh, restrictions are lifted, the numbers will go up. And it, it's not just the numbers that one should be keeping an eye on. It's really the change from day to day. So what is the, the doubling time? What is uh, the R0 uh, or the transmission rate? What is the testing uh, per million? And what is the positivity rate? That gives a good indication of uh, how much infection there is in that community. And that, again, when you look at the data, you can see vast differences between states, between cities. And I think the other big challenge uh, for India is making sure that the rest of the health system continues to, to perform because we know that there's a huge burden of both infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases in the population. And uh, so that has to be balanced uh, with the response, the COVID response. So I would say that really the focus coming back needs to be on primary health care and public health. And the one thing that stood out in this pandemic is that those places or those countries that have focused on a very strong public health response are the ones who've been able to 
bring it under control. So even in countries which have relatively, we say, strong health systems and good hospitals, they've, they've provided excellent care to people who've been hospitalized. But the response in the tracking and tracing, contact tracing, and the ramping up the testing, the isolation, the border, those have sometimes uh, fallen behind. It's led to these huge, huge peaks. So there needs to be a comprehensive strategy. We know that one intervention alone, even stringent lockdowns are not the solution. So you need the public health response of testing and tracking and making sure that every infected individual is taken care of and the contacts are quarantined. And then you also need, of course, to build your health system, your bed capacity, the oxygen availability in the district hospitals, the training of healthcare workers, and the protection of frontline health workers. Okay, one more quick question, Manit, and then we have to uh, wrap up, please. About the efficacy of wearing face masks, could you talk a little bit about the WHO's guidelines on it? Uh, Sylvie and then uh, Samia, uh, Dr. Sylvie and then Dr. Samia. Okay, so uh, face masks uh, um, um, are very useful for uh, protecting uh, health, uh, our people working with, uh, with uh, sick people, uh, because they are very exposed. We have always recommended that uh, workers or, or people working in a nursing home or or even at home, if you take care of patients, it's very important to wear masks. Uh, we have also always recommended masks for people who are uh, sick uh, because uh, they are um, likely to transmit the disease and so they need to protect the others. Um, then we, uh, when we know that the disease is transmitted uh, by droplets, meaning that um, uh, if you keep sufficient uh, physical distancing, uh, normally it's enough uh, to protect uh, yourself and reduce transmission. Uh, what happens is that uh, physical distancing is sometimes extremely difficult to maintain. Uh, in many places, um, there, there is high density of population, uh, whether it's in public transport or people living, for instance, uh, in, uh, in crowded space uh, and, and confined uh, environments. So, um, that's why uh, WHO recently um, uh, recommended also that people uh, that are in this kind of situation, uh, they can wear masks as well to protect themselves and protect the others and reduce the transmission ultimately. Thank you. Let's, let's go to Dr. Samia. So this is a good example of an uh, area where we have changed our uh, guidance from the beginning till now when we learned of more about the transmission and also learning from countries and, and, and the epidemiology and what was going on. So now we have uh, guidance, of course, from the beginning on what healthcare workers should do to protect themselves, where you need a surgical mask or medical mask, where do you need an N95 mask. But the, the recent guidance is, talks about those who are sick above 60 years or those who have other diseases must wear a medical mask when they go out. And everyone who's living in, uh, in places where you cannot physically distance which is large parts of the world, where it's impossible to maintain a distance of over one meter, you should wear a face covering. And we've provided additional guidance on the most effective mask. So three layers, the inner layer being cotton, then polypropylene, and then a third layer, which is... Uh, so if you can make, and these can be made very cheaply locally, if you wear these uh, three layer masks, then there is a good chance that you don't pass those droplets on. The other thing to remember now is as uh, officers and then later schools and colleges will open and people will start going back into settings where they are together. I think it's really important that every environment think about how to make it safe for people. And this includes distancing the seating arrangements, making sure there's hand washing or disinfectants available, making sure that masks are worn if the distancing is not possible, making sure that people who are sick don't come to work, have some kind of a screening uh, mechanism and then take care of uh, people who are sick. And if there is a, 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 a somebody who gets sick, then it's important to make sure that all the co-workers are screened and um, and that because in closed environments, this virus can spread much more easily. And, and so it's important. We've seen call centers where hundreds of people got infected 
from one individual because they're all working within a closed environment. So some, some of these precautions need to be instituted now before there's a complete uh, opening up of society and people go back to their business. I, I know you both have to leave because you, you have a meeting uh, in, a, in a minute. So I'm going to just mention a few topics and in your final comment, if you can incorporate any or all of them, there've been, we've gotten many questions about uh, WHO and China. We've gotten questions about what is President Trump doing with WHO. We also got questions whether you would uh, say to President Trump, don't have that rally. He is having 20,000 people in an enclosed stadium on Saturday. So, so many different questions. You're welcome to tackle any or all of them in a final comment each. We'll start with Dr. Sylvie. Please follow her at SC Bryan on Twitter. Yeah, I think we 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 know that when uh, people gather, there's a risk for transmitting the virus. So, uh, really, my advice for those people, if they attend those mass gathering, uh, they need to protect themselves and really, really be careful and observe uh, all the recommendations we have um, put on 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 the web. Uh, we have put recommendations for mass gathering, but also um, for personal measures. So, if people uh, look at this. Uh, Really, I advise them to protect themselves uh, because um, the virus is still circulating, and and um, even if most of the people will have my disease, uh, still it's it's a very difficult disease. I can tell you because my son and my husband got it, and it's it's really uh, uh, more severe than flu, and uh, it's not a nice moment. So uh, it's really better if people can avoid to um, uh, to get it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Brian. Uh, we wish you the very best uh, and lots of great comments coming in and questions. Uh, we hope we'll be able to have you back. Thank you very much. Let's go to Dr. Salmia. Uh, we have questions uh, also here is Dabur saying that Dr. Salmia's take on where the virus will take us is just incredible. So with that, your comments and your final thoughts on anything we brought up in the last minute. So I see that there are some great questions and comments, and uh, one of them, of course, is about vaccines and when we will we have vaccines. And as Sylvie was saying, we have a lot to be hopeful and optimistic about because there are a huge number of different platforms that are being tested. We already have 11 candidates which have gone into clinical trials. We should have results before the end of the year for at least three or four of them. Then, of course, is the challenge, if they are found to be effective and safe, the challenge of manufacturing billions of doses. We're not talking here in millions, but in billions to protect people. But I think that's what we're doing now. We have this uh, program called the ACT Accelerator, which brings together many, many partners, including the private sector, including all the big global uh, health agencies uh, and the big philanthropies to accelerate the development of a vaccine as well as therapeutics um, by investing in the science, but also investing in manufacturing facilities in advance of the science that we through them. So I'm optimistic, but cannot be 100% sure because unless the trials are done, we don't know if vaccine will work. But I think in 2021, we're going to have vaccines that at least to protect the most vulnerable members of our society. And then finally, I'd like to say the way WHO works is through our expert networks. And we have 194 member states. All of them participate in our scientific activities. Uh, whether it's China, whether it's the US, or uh, any country in the world, our expert groups have very broad geographic uh, diversity. And that's what really I think is, is our strength, because we call upon and we, we rely upon expertise from different parts of the world. And so regardless of the geopolitics, the technical work, the scientific work has not been affected, luckily. And that's why I said, We've seen incredible collaboration, incredible solidarity in that community, and really wanting to pull together, uh, knowing that only that's the only way to defeat this and come out of the pandemic. Thank you. I know you both have to leave, so we're just very grateful to you for being here. Uh, Dr. Salmia Swaminathan, doctor spelled out Salmia on Twitter, at Dr. Salmia, and at SC Brian, Dr. Sylvie Brian, head of the pandemics and uh, infectious diseases, in, in epidemic diseases department. She's the director there. Thank you both very much. We wish you the best. You're fighting for all of us and we're very, very grateful. Thank you very much, Sri. Hope to see you again sometime. Thank you. Bye-bye.
And uh, thank you for watching. We are going to bring back our friend from Scroll, the reporter who's been covering the pandemic in India and just get her thoughts as well. Uh, please welcome back Amanat Kuller. She's at scroll.in, our partner in these shows. And uh, Amanat, thank you for being here. Thank you for staying. Uh, uh, tell me about what's, first of all, what you thought of the conversation and also where you think this is uh, about the answers we got and what's happening in India, because those of us sitting here are so distracted by what's happening in America that we haven't had a chance to understand properly what's happening in India. Yeah, so it was a very enlightening conversation, especially uh, getting experts who are basically on the front lines and helping develop the vaccine uh, helps us understand where we are. Uh, we know that possibly a second wave is coming. And uh, I think everyone's sort of really anxious about what the future holds, what the next six months or the next year is going to look like. Uh, so in terms of India, so uh, India went into lockdown pretty quickly. Uh, and for extended periods of uh, like for several weeks, we were in lockdown and there was basically no movement. Uh, but as uh, measures have started to ease up, because a country like India, where, which uh, where the economy is uh, highly dependent on uh, informal workers, etc. We couldn't stay locked down for extended periods of time. And now that we've opened up, uh, the cases have started rising. And uh, we have started to realize that we are actually not very well prepared in terms of our public health care systems. Uh, in Delhi, where I am, uh, in the last 10 or so days, uh, there are extended reports of hospitals running out of beds. Um, people are reaching out on Twitter and social media and asking for help, whether they have any connections, etc., for their sick family members where who can get some basic health care right now. So. Um, I think everyone's really anxious about where this is headed. And uh, yeah, we're hoping for the best. Yeah, there, there's some extra noise coming in from the, your microphone somehow, but that's OK. Uh, <laughs> just want to say to everyone who's watching, thank you for watching. I know there were a lot of questions. We couldn't get to all of them because they, they had to go to a meeting. You know, they're, they're working on a, you know, late in, in Geneva, and they gave us a half hour. And we were grateful for that. Uh, people are saying they were happy to see this. I, I thought you would like this comment, uh, uh, Amanat, because uh, she says, "Good." Uh, Makran says, "Good." Uh, scroll is cool. Good to see the people behind it. So that's why we're we're doing this. And uh, uh, Iman says that uh, uh, thanks, Sri. This is awesome. And she worked with JAMA, with the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is uh, great that she's doing. Believe in science, says Lois. Believe in science. Pay attention. And uh, uh, Arjun's watching from Jaisalmer. And Stefan's watching from Ramsey, New Jersey. Uh, just great to have all of these people here. Tell shows you the kind of reach that Scroll has all over the world. It's not just India. For people who don't know Scroll, talk a little bit about it, please. Um, Scroll uh, India is um, like an independent news publication. Uh, we have offices in Delhi uh, and Mumbai. Um, and uh, we basically cover a lot of ground reports. We focus on healthcare, politics, et cetera. And you can find us on scroll.in. And uh, what is what do you typically cover? I'm sure you are not the permanent pandemics reporter for yes. Scroll. So uh, you've also been at Scroll a relatively short time. But uh, yeah. talk a little bit about your own work and background, please. Uh, yes. So uh, I joined Scroll very recently. Uh, I've been here for about two weeks now. Uh, I've been covering the South Asian diaspora uh, in the United States. Yeah, that's basically what I've been doing here. Okay. And I've been, yeah, so I've been reaching out to a lot of people, uh, the Indian uh, Americans uh, who are in different cities in the United States, and I'm uh, just understanding what their experiences are, um, especially at a time like this uh, in the last few weeks where the Black Lives Matter protests really blew up, what anxieties they're facing, and yeah, just getting them connected. Uh, look at this. Scroll is my school in lockdown. Isn't that amazing? And... Uh, and uh, Jonathan says, but it was a great half hour. And uh, and uh, somebody else says, Scroll is amazing from Maharashtra. And Scroll is influencing in a positive way. So I hope you'll take all of this back uh, to your uh, to your teams. This is not a question that came for you, but about why, how does COVID work? And uh, please explain it scientifically, ma'am. I'm not going to ask you to do that. So you don't have to worry, don't have to worry about it. Uh, but with that, I can let you go if you don't have any other comments or anything you'd like to share. No, thanks for having me on Sri. This was really fun. Thank you. And the idea here is that we are working together, Scroll and My Daily Show. We have 
put together uh, now 99 shows. And you can see in our numbers here how we're doing the first 75 shows with 155 guests and 91 women. And I thought it was really great to see two female leaders speaking from WHO that really uh, emphasizes the role that uh, women leaders, scientists, doctors are playing in this fight. And uh, it's very important for people to see that and look at these numbers. It's just been fantastic to uh, work with your team uh, in Scroll. So thank you very much. And we'll see you soon, Amara. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks so much for watching, everybody. We had so little time today. We couldn't thank our sponsors at the beginning. But we also have a really cool thing you can do for our 100th show. So don't forget that this has been an incredible week of shows. And we end uh, this week, this run, with a 100th show tomorrow. We'll have uh, Noliway Rooks, the W.E.B. W. E. B. Du Bois Professor of Literature at Cornell, and Brandy Harden, a lawyer and board member at Justice Aid, and several other guests, including Jonathan Borstein, who's joining us. Jonathan is our uh, most loyal viewer. He's watched for 99 straight days, and he'll make it to 100 tomorrow, and so he'll be with us. I'm very excited about that. And we want you to go back and look at our archives, youtube.com slash Screenet. And you can find it also at scroll.in's background uh, uh, on their archives as well. You can see Sunday started with Peter Herford. And Peter is a gentleman you see behind the legendary Walter Cronkite. Walter is getting the news of JFK's assassination handed to him. And Peter's on the wire. He's the gentleman in the glasses behind the legendary Walter Cronkite. So uh, this is the kind of shows we're doing and topics we're covering. And please check us out and please come back and be a regular viewer if you've just stumbled on us today. Let's thank our sponsors, Art & Co. Get involved with the world's largest online art auction fundraising for COVID-19 victims, artandco.net, artandco.net. Also, if you have a teenager, the Global Virtual Teen Camp, Global Entrepreneurship Experience, get 20% off with the code SREE, globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org globalentrepreneurshipexperience.org, 20% off code with S-R-E-E. -E. Also want to tell you that my Fundamentals of Social Media course is now live, and you can sign up and watch and get a certification in the Fundamentals of Social, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. 4,000 people are taking that class right now. It's just two hours with lots of videos, lots of information, quizzes, and you can get a certificate right at the end of it. And here's what the certificate looks like. I think it's pretty cute that uh, we were able to do this and you get your own certificate and it's completely free. We have lots of great shows coming up, but for the 100th show, we want you to participate. So we have a special new way that you can send us a video. And we're using a tool that teachers use all over the world called Flipgrid. So just go to flipgrid.com slash three show, flipgrid.com slash three show, or use this QR code. And it'll, be, it'll take you to a page where you can upload a picture of or a video that you want to share. So this is Mark Lee's video that he wanted to share. And you just hit this big button. And anything you'd like for a minute, you can share with us. We'd love to have you participate in our 100th show. We'll show the videos on air. So please join us at flipgrid.com slash three show. Here it is again, flipgrid.com slash three show. And thank you all very much for being here. Uh, we want to also show you that we have this QR code that will help you access our, our uh, alert system for for WhatsApp. This is not a WhatsApp group. All of this is is an alert whenever we go live. So just hold up your phone and grab that QR code and you will be told when we are live. We have so many shows still to come, of course. We promised we would do this as long as we're on lockdown in New York and we will be for some more time. So please do sign up and be with us. Please email us if you have any questions. You see my email right there, three at three dot net. I'm at three on uh, Twitter, at Srinet on Instagram, and please follow scroll underscore in on Twitter and scroll dot in the website that helps bring this all to you. And we also, speaking of medical issues, we want to tell you about a new show that we have launched that we want to tell you about. We are executive producing the show. It's called She's on Call, and it's a show that is about uh, two female surgeons talking about what they have learned and taking your questions 
And you can find it at She's On Call on Twitter, on YouTube, and on Facebook. So please search She's On Call and please sign up. And finally, we want to say that we have promised, uh, based on what one of our guests said, they said, say their names. You know, we're talking not just about medical emergencies and the health situation, but we're also talking about the financial situation and we're talking about the racial injustice in America. And so on this show, we have promised every episode to say their names, the names who uh, of the victims of the killings that should never have happened. So we are basing this off of this portrait by Typhus, Titus Kaffer uh, to mark the killing of George Floyd. And this is based on this image, a haunting image of jo young George Floyd with his mother, Larcinia. He would die two years almost to the day after she died and they're buried next to each other. And this is the portrait that he made, the painting he made based on this photograph. And these are the names we want to read to you. Trayvon Martin, Yvette Smith, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Jerame Reed, Natasha McKenna, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, William Chapman, Sandra Bland, Darius Stewart, Samuel DuBose, Janet Wilson, Callan Rockmore, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Joseph Mann, Terence Crutcher, Chad Robertson, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Stefan Clark, Danny Ray Thomas, Antoine Rose, Botham Jean, Tatiana Jefferson, Michael Dean, Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. And to that list, we must also add Rashad Brooks, who was shot dead last weekend in Atlanta. He was asleep in his car and, and uh, he had a 40 minute peaceful, no weapons involved on either side conversation, wanted to go home to his family and uh, there was a scuffle and he got a hold of a, one of the tasers of one of the officers. They shot him with a taser, they missed, and then he shot back. The, and at that moment, he was shot and killed with a gun as he ran away. A taser is not considered a lethal weapon in the American system. And that's how the, the police are able to justify using it. And so there is no reason, as you heard in the DA's outlining yesterday, there's no reason that you would then uh, use lethal force against a non-lethal weapon. It's non-lethal on both sides if they're using it. Anyway, it's so much for us to learn and we are humbled to be able to have this conversation on so many things. Uh, we're very grateful to everyone who's joined us. Please uh, keep sharing your comments. Please watch every single day. We're on the air either usually 9 p.m. Eastern or noon, uh, noon Eastern when we can. So many different uh, comments coming in. Iman says, uh, QR code is amazing, and uh, we are talking about uh, how we're reading the names. That's great. Jonathan already took our course, and uh, LinkedIn user says, this is great, plus all the items you're doing in addition. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We're very, very uh, on, on, honored to be able to do this. And big day tomorrow with our 100th show. And Sudha Parikh is, uh, says, very good information from WHO representatives and scientists. And it turns out that Sudha worked on the same, uh, worked, taught at the same medical school, the Armed Forces Medical College in Pune, which is a fantastic medical school. Uh, she taught there also at a, perhaps at a different time, but was there as well. We forgot to mention one more thing we're doing on, uh, so we have a great, uh, let me just give you the lineup of the weekend. Friday night is our 100th episode. Saturday at noon to two hours, we do our uh, weekly radio call-in show on WBAI. It's called Coping with COVID, a helpful, hopeful call-in show, and we'll have great guests for that. And then on Saturday night, we're going to talk career strategy and what you can do in the middle of this pandemic to work on your career. And we'll be meeting Jacqueline Dolly, who's a terrific expert, and she'll share her views on what you can do. That's 9 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. Sunday morning, 8.30 a.m., starts with our Sunday New York Times read along. That's right, we read the Sunday New York Times out loud for five years. We've been doing it sort of like crazy people. 
and we discuss the print edition of the New York Times. And our guest will be the print editor of the New York Times, Tom Jolly. Please follow him at Tom Jolly. We would love to have him have a great audience from all of you. And then at 11 p.m., we will, 11 a.m., right after that, we'll be having the episode of She's On Call with our new show that we're executive producing with two great female doctors. And then my usual Sunday night show, but it's Father's Day in America. So I'll be uh, hosting my twins, Durga and Krishna, who are 17 years old. The only reason they agreed to come on my show was because it's Father's Day. Uh, whether we've had seven-year-olds, nine-year-olds, perspectives from all of these kids about what it's like to be uh, under pandemic, and now we'll hear from them. And because it's Father's Day, we're offering you a really special opportunity. Thank a father figure in your life, a grandfather, uncle, male role model, anyone, and just submit a picture and a message and we'll read it on the air. Go to digimentors.link slash Father's Day, digimentors.link slash Father's Day. If you cannot afford the price, let us know. We'll make sure you're still able to do it. You get 50% of the proceeds will go to charity, but please go to digimentors.link slash Father's Day. If you uh, don't get the link, just email me, sri at sri.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E.net. Thank you very much, everybody. Honored to have you all here. Comments are still coming in. We're very grateful. Anand says, thank you for the show. You're welcome. And can't wait for show number 100. And we have talked about having Iman and uh, the team from JAMA participate as well. We'd love to uh, have them come on the show as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Please email me, sri at sri.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E.